You need to go. Mr. Wick. Is the sommelier here? I have never known him not to be. Good afternoon, Mr. Wick. I'd like a tasting. I know of your past fondness for the German varietals, but I can wholeheartedly endorse the new breed of Austrians. Could you recommend anything for the end of the night? Something big, bold. May I suggest the Benelli Volge, an Italian classic. In this video, we're going to cover 30 of the best weapons to craft in Bannerlord. If John Wick were in Calradia, this would be his armory. Let's jump right into it. Since there are so many weapons in this video, I decided to create a database to collect them all. I'll put screenshots up a couple times for you, but the best way to access this is through the Discord server. In the useful guide info section, you will find a link to the database where you can see all the relevant stats, and most importantly, the copy-paste text that you can use in-game, which will save you a ton of time. Simply click on this box right here, press Ctrl. Control A, then Control C. Then go to the Smithy in game. Make sure you selected the right weapon category first, then press Control V, and voila, you have the exact same weapon from the guide with all the part sizing already done. Check the description for a link to the Discord. There are 1,519 weapon parts to unlock in 12 different categories. I've curated a list of the best from each category. The process for making each was very specific. I would start with a concept such as highest swing damage. Looking at the blade first, I would go through every possible selection looking for the highest damage value, then continue down the list until all four parts were selected. Then I would max out each part size and scale them back slightly to pick up extra points without sacrificing damage stats. There were a few edge cases where giving up one or two damage points was done in order to pick up five to ten stats in other categories, making the overall weapon objectively better. With that out of the way, let's dive right into the armory. Up first, the daggers. This chunky boy boasts 57 swing damage and still manages an astounding 106 swing speed and 100 handling. The the biggest drawback of using daggers is fighting multiple targets at once, so I highly recommend pairing this with a set of the best throwing daggers, the Assassin's Whisper, which hit extremely hard, 44 pierce damage each. We can thin the herd from a distance with the throwing daggers, which can one-shot with enough throwing skill or a headshot. When it's time to close the distance, this dagger can disembowel with ease. It's quick and responsive, making defense a breeze. The attack speed is blindingly fast, and the enemy won't know it hit them. Teabag anyone? Feel like being a bit more stabby? This next dagger's for you. Rather than going for damage, we max for thrusting speed, which can pierce through armor more effectively than cut damage. At 103 thrust speed, this dagger will fell any tyrant in no time. Don't forget to pack a set of throwing knives though, as fighting off more than two at once will be quite the challenge. Headshots can crit as high as 500 with these throwing knives. The key to getting good thrust damage is forward momentum while attacking. This dagger is nibble enough to block quick strikes and down stronger opponents in two hits. Kiano's personal brand of tea. 
Now for the most devastating weapon on the list. Nothing comes close to the damage output of the Boomstick. At 141 base damage, this javelin can hit for upwards of 1000 with the right perks. And the best part is we can take 3 stacks and a shield for maximum damage output. For most of the tests, we will be fighting against this mid to high tier Sturgeon group, including a Noble. This horse gets one shot even with Noble armor. Impale is probably my favorite perk in all of Bannerlord. Even without the movement speed bonus, we still manage nearly 900 damage on this noble. If you're on a bit of a budget and haven't grinded javelin unlocks, then the fishing rod is a perfect alternative. With all tier 2 parts, this weapon is easy to unlock and still manages 118 damage with 5 javelins per stack. Incredible value. Shield and 3 stacks of javelins. Check. Yep. It'll still one-shot anything it touches. This one went right through the shield but missed his body. That's pretty cool. The same hit with the fishing rod still yields 744 damage. Certainly nothing budget about this build. Dwayne the dog is a great companion because everything he touches turns to prisoners. Perfect for a bounty hunter. 72 blunt damage for a one-headed mace? Yes, I'll have some of that. And by 72 damage, I really meant 298. Even against heavily armored targets, a headshot can do over 100. It certainly feels hefty when fighting heads up, so be prepared to parry kick, and shield bash. I'm including this 6 attack combo so we can compare attack speeds for everything at the end. Dwayne's no Santa's little helper, but he'll do just fine. I know what you're thinking, no, this isn't a meme. It's a legit build. Hey, hey, don't laugh. Size isn't as important as the ladies make it out to be. At 33 range, these brass knuckles are pretty much like punching people with your bare fist. But at 120 attack speed, we'll be floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. As you probably guessed, there are challenges with using the brass knuckles while mounted. Once the gap is closed, we can tear the enemy apart with brutal efficiency. With some mounted combat experience, 151 damage one shots are still doable. On foot is where this weapon shines though. Easily able to strike before the opponent does, even while being blocked. Okay, this took me about 10 tries. It's way too fast. The joy of Lindisfarne celebrates the spreading of Scandinavian culture over to England. The tools of the trade, a one-handed axe that can split a human in half. At 84 cut damage, this thing will easily bless the monks with a single swipe. Without movement speed bonuses, the damage is just under 100, but attack speed is more than enough to overcome most opponents. Correction, it can one-shot a noble, no problem. On foot is where the Lindisfarne truly feels at home though, helping people take forever naps since 973 AD. It's certainly not the fastest, but it is a decent balance of damage and speed. Need a quick haircut? The Tomahawk is an excellent option as it offers above average damage of 59, but blinding speed at 111. A quick message from my lawyer, Gregory. We aren't responsible for loss of scalp while using this product. The Tomahawk's fast, but not like the brass knuckles, and care must be taken with defense still. Wow, it even one-shots heavy armor. It's not so good against cavalry though, unless you're John Wick that is. This is top tier armor and it nearly one-shot him. Get dunked on, son. Wow, I didn't know lawyers spoke like that. The Tomahawk is very fast. Not all heroes wear capes, but the best ones use a shield and this one-handed sword is no exception. With damage of 105, length of 121, and bonus damage to enemy shields, the Captain America is incredibly potent. Let's go get this son of a One shot high-end armor, check. One shot nobles too? Yep. I'm not usually a fan of one handed weapons, but this thing feels really good in hand. It's quite a bit slower than other speed weapons we've looked at, which is the only downside. Arigato gozaimasu. The Kodachi is a short, single edge blade designed for speed. What this one handed sword lacks in damage, it more than makes up for in swing speed at 116. It shouldn't be the first pick for mounted combat, lacking range and damage. But on foot, this thing absolutely dominates. The fast attack speed ensures enemy attacks are stopped in their tracks. It's like watching poetry in motion. Beautiful. If you've seen the first weapons guide, this one might look familiar. It's the little brother of Satan's Tooth. Satan's Bicuspid is the one-handed version and is an incredible value, requiring no Themyscene steel to achieve great all-around stats. It has decent range, so mounted combat is viable. It can easily one-shot good armor and nobles. And while it's not as fast as the Kodachi, this Bicuspid can hold its own in head-to-head -head combat on foot. For those who don't need thrusting attacks, I highly recommend this. 
The next weapon needs no explanation, but just in case, here's a picture. The Mandingo is an extremely long pike that can reach enemy cavalry before they reach us. At just under 300 units long, it's no wonder they call it the Mandingo. It's highly discouraged to use this weapon without a backup, so we take the brass knuckles along as well. As you can see, even with the solid hit, the damage is tiny due to the enemy crowding our attacks. Our trusty sidearm makes quick work, allowing us to focus on the enemy cavalry. Line it up, and... Like boom, headshot! Boom! I'm curious. Okay, doesn't go there. Sorry, dude. I can't say the name for the next weapon, for reasons which will become obvious soon. Notice there's a stat line for swing damage, which will be important to remember. This is me attempting to initiate a swing attack, but going into convulsions instead. Tail worlds lied to me. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Time for another Viking classic, the Skegox. These throwing axes do incredible damage for their size at 86. They even hold their own in melee combat. They only pack 3 per stack, and I love to crack. So 3 sets for me, now we attack. The enemy mount goes down to a single axe, but these things are so hard to aim. Another one shot against good armor. With the right perks, we can bust through shields in two shots and kill on the third. While I don't recommend using them in melee, the Skegox can be used in an emergency. It has low damage, but decent attack speed. Now for one of the audience's favorites, the Danax. If you thought Denmark was known for their pastries, think again. The Danax is one of the deadliest weapons in Calradia, boasting 141 damage and the ability to cleave through multiple targets in a single swipe. Observe. Prefer to fight on foot? Tap the enemy mount on the head and proceed. It can even cleave through a rider and hit the mount in a single hit. It's just so satisfying to use the Danax. God bless De I mean Odin bless Denmark. Tak. Now for a truly horrifying weapon, the Executioner's Cavalry Axe. At 152 length, this weapon can hold its own in mounted combat. And at 135 swing damage, it packs more than enough punch to deal with any armor. It can take some time to adjust to the length and swing speed, but it's well worth the effort. Another two for one. The two drawbacks of using a weapon like this are the handling and the swing speed. Unless you hit close to the center where the sweet spot is, damage will be minimal. I know you want to see more heads roll, here you go. If you've ever wondered how much wood can a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood, well Bannerlord has you covered. At 108 attack speed, this two-handed woodchuck can chuck a lot. You might think the damage is low, but think again. It's an easy one-shot for both of these armored enemies. Here we chop wood faster than the enemy, hence why he is doomed to fail. The range isn't terrible either, we get a nice one-shot while mounted. One interesting note, this weapon uses an opposite stance, and we have to start the combo from the left instead of the right like most of the other weapons. Next up, the Breakfast Club. Okay, this might need some context. Two hits. Me hitting you, you hitting the floor. <sighs> I'm getting old. This beast can ruin lives. At 85 damage, it's one of the highest in the game for a blunt weapon. And since blunt ignores a large portion of armor, it excels against the best units in the game. We make quick work of the foot troops, one-shotting each. Similar to the two-handed axe, the Breakfast Club can go through rider and hit the horse as well. Pretty neat. Well, that's a first for me. Horse and rider in one hit? As I'm writing this, I just realized Breakfast Club is a pun. I apologize profusely. I can assure you this was not intentional. I'm not that clever. Lucille loves being sung to. It's about the only thing she loves more than bashing in her brains. Weird, huh? Lucille is the perfect companion for mounted skull cracking. 143 length and 85 blunt force trauma. I love this woman. Strad, if your wife hears you, you're toast. Divorce is really expensive. Lucille is hungry. She cleans up on foot and on horse without any issues. She's a little slow, but when she connects, it's like watching art. You are so gonna regret crossing me in a few minutes. Yes, you are. You're a lovely girl, Lucille. In my recent World Conquest series, I showcased El Bonco Grande. Unfortunately, Tail Worlds killed him off in patch 1.8, so we're left with his little nephew, El Doinco Chiquito. While this little two-handed hammer may not pack a big punch, it does have an impressive 108 attack speed. We even hit for over 100, but the leader must have HP perks. El Doinco Chiquito feels so good in the hands, and it has the knockoff perk, allowing us to dismount enemy cavalry. Be sure to smack the horse though, so they don't remount. Gracias, el doinco chiquito. Te amo.
This next weapon is dedicated to Tail Worlds. I'm a huge fan of Turkish food and shish kebab is the best. It's a lot of work to get the meat on the stick though, so instead we use this tool to skewer the enemies. It's not the longest at 189, but was built for the highest thrust pierce damage, making it the deadliest. Vlad the Impaler was somewhat of a master at making shish kebab, saving him loads of prep work. As always with a long polearm, I recommend a sidearm as backup. I'm not sure why, but landing a couch lance always makes me laugh. If you're having trouble hitting the target, be sure to overcorrect your aim, meaning aim further than you think you should. If your lance is too close to you, it's a guaranteed miss. If you overshoot the aim, you can still hit the far side of the enemy, and even a bad hit will do 400 or more damage. Here we can see the shortcomings of a long polearm in a heads up fight. Shield bashing and kicks are the only way to land meaningful hits, or just use your sidearm. This weapon saw extensive use during the Hundred Years' War, and so we've lovingly named this Volge after the famous French king, Charles Le Fou, or Charles the Mad. I think using this 200 length, 161 cut damage weapon on a human being would drive me mad too. It slices right through high-end armor like butter. Désolé cheval. The reach is phenomenal, as we can strike these infantry without fear of retaliation. Let's try it out on foot. No, don't you dare. Volu, volu. You're a traitorous horse. Time for another Agincourt. It's certainly not an easy fight on foot when they close the distance, so I do recommend a sidearm. I think you get the point. It's really slow. Legend has it that Popeye's polearm is so huge, it can only be swung by someone with arms as big as Popeye's. At 275, it takes a real brute to rotate this thing. The best part about this polearm? Aiming is more of a suggestion than a requirement. Swing in the general direction and you'll most likely hit something. It's a bit slow, so enemies paying attention can block more frequently. Where Popeye's polearm shines is cavalry versus cavalry battles. It's nearly impossible for someone to have a longer polearm than us, which makes it a safe choice. Okay, we're not sitting through this whole combo. Not for this one. You shall not get butter. One of my personal favorites, the Gandalf is a polearm that can brace. No cavalry shall pass. At 249, it's not far off from the pikes, but also doesn't require unlocking parts in that awful group. Bracing is quite effective even without polearm skill, so I can recommend this build for any campaign. It's not effective at heads up combat on foot, so it's best to keep this weapon for cavalry charges only. Any cavalry charging at us will be one shot if we can land the hit. Aiming for the horse is a great alternative if you're not skilled with bracing yet. Time for some fun. Your weapon? It will kill is an amazingly fun polearm, meant for combat on foot. At only 158 length, it can handle combat at close and medium distances. And with 179 swing cut damage, even looking at the blade will one-shot you. I recommend bringing a shield to close the distance, then switch to two-handed mode to disembowel these poor souls. Ooh, 400 damage while on foot? This thing should be splitting people in half. Even hits far outside of the sweet spot nearly one-shot these high-tier troops. Gotta love those jump shots. It's certainly not as fast as some two-handed swords, but it has much more versatility. This idiot kid, get out of here! I'll be able to keep my fish here, thank you, old man, kid. Get this idiot kid out of here! Damn! Das Zweihander ist sehr groß. Sorry. This two handed sword is huge. At 130 length and 155 swing cut damage, even a scratch from this weapon would prove fatal. Fighting head to head will require some finesse as the swing is slow and telegraphed, making for an easy block. But once the guard is passed, it's lights out. We can easily one shot any charging horse and its heavily armored rider. Did I mention jump shots are even easier with it? Wielding this weapon is more than just stats, it makes you feel unstoppable. The next two-handed sword is so big, it can only be used while mounted or by an incredibly large man, like the mountain from Game of Thrones. At nearly 150 length, this sword can compete with shorter pole arms. Just for reference, it goes from John Wick's ankles up past his head. Good luck pulling this one out of the scabbard. It feels heavy to use, but when it hits, you know something spectacular just took place. The thrust damage isn't anything to write home about, so be sure to swing away instead. This is a great option for mounted combat. The swing speed isn't too bad either, but but it makes sense to carry a backup just in case. 
If thrust damage is more your style, then boy do I have a surprise for you. Backed by popular demand, Hito Rick and his signature blade, the Rippin and the Terran. I'm not sure we can match his thrusting power, but at 58 thrust pierce damage, we'll give it a shot. This blade is fantastic for civilian loadouts, but I recommend taking a set of Assassin's Whisper to avoid too big of a mob. Okay, maybe we can outthrust Hito Rick. 175 damage up to over 300 for a thrust is amazing. Of course he joined the teabagging. Because prison breaks are notoriously cramped, I prefer a thrusting weapon like the Rippin and the Terran. As long as we can maintain forward momentum when the thrust lands, we will have no problem one-shotting everybody. It's quite good in defense as well, very responsive. Don't forget to use those throwing daggers. The biggest challenge with thrusting weapons is fighting multiple shielded enemies. Look at that horse damage. And one-shot the noble too. And because it's my favorite weapon in the game, we're including Satan's Tooth. I've changed a few parts to make it more affordable than previous versions, making this the budget build for two-handed swords. At 100 swing speed and 130 swing damage, there's nothing budget about it. Not only can this sword one-shot everything, but it has incredible attack speed and deals bonus damage to shields. With 114 reach, it's possible to take out cavalry, although it's a highly risky move. Overall, this is my favorite weapon in the game, and I highly recommend trying it out at least once. And for our final build, the Ankle Biter. Everyone's come across one of these at some point in their life. They look sexy, they talk a big game, but their bark is much worse than their bite. However, in this case, our Ankle Biter packs a punch as well. At 64 damage and 117 swing speed, our overall damage output potential is still strong. Against low armor targets, attack damage is more than enough to one shot. The biggest threat for the Ankle Biter is multiple attackers at the same time, being able to attack through their dying comrades. This sword is very fast. I decided to include a quick bonus, some Tail World's math for all of you. On the left is a weapon that uses all tier 4 parts. On the right, all tier 2 parts. Notice at the bottom how they both require the exact same crafting materials. Tail World's has still not fixed the wrong crafting materials for these parts, allowing us to make a blade that sells for 3 times the profit than it should. It's still possible to make millions with crafting, and here is your key to success. Here in my garage, Let's look at some side-by-side -side comparisons for a few of the weapon groups, starting with one-handed fast speed options. They all have about the same time to complete the six-move combo, and the choice should come down to personal preference, as they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. Personally, I love the brass knuckle one-handed mace. The two-handed sword is quite a bit faster than all the others, but damage output is much greater with the axe and mace due to the cleave ability. The polearm is a nice option if you've only leveled up polearm and none of the other melee skills. The two-handed axe, woodchuck, is my personal pick here, although the polearm is very tempting. Now for the one-handed damage builds. The budget build performed the fastest and is nearly tied for top damage, making Satan's Bicuspid my personal pick. Moving on to two-handed weapons, it's always amazing to see how slow the huge polearm really is when compared side by side. The other three all finish within a couple frames of each other and the pick should come down to personal preference. I really like the mace because it's new, but the others would work as well. So, John Wick, now that you've seen the armory, do you think you'll come back? People keep asking if I'm back, and I haven't really had an answer. But now, yeah, I'm thinking I'm back! As I mentioned at the start, the database for all weapons will be available on the Discord. Check the useful guide info section and look for the top 30 crafted weapons link for 1.8. Don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe. It would really mean a lot to me. And a huge shout out to all the Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. Without your help, videos like these would be impossible. Thank you and I'll see you on the next one. Das Zweihander ist sehr gro groß. Gro groß. As you can see, is it? As you can see, even with our solid, the ankle biter. <laughs>